Welcome, my friends. Monday, March the 3rd, 2014. It's hard to believe March is here. Let's get the temperature up to 40. Maybe we have some control of the weather. Anyway, it's pretty cold. You can tell by the picture out behind me there. Look at that out the windows here. This, everything is covered with snow. But it's going to be reaching 40 degrees here somewhere one of these days. I used to think, uh, years ago, I used to think once it got to be uh, St. Patty's Day, we were all set, but I'm beginning to wonder how things are going in the weather situation nowadays. But I suppose it's all up to global warming, but <clears throat> there's nothing we can do about global warming except don't burn so much coal, I guess. That's the deal. All right, we're getting a new city auditor. Jerry Surratt's been around a long time. Huh, long time, must be 30 years at least. I don't know how long he's been there, but he's been there a long time. He's been, a, I guess he's done a pretty good job. Uh, he announced last year that he was gonna do uh, his retirement this year. So the human resources person, Mrs. Cox, is uh, gonna start looking at uh, resumes of people who might wanna be city auditor. That's a city council appointment. So they'll get the, I don't know if they, uh, everybody gets the interview, the prospective new city auditor, but uh, I'm sure they must have a personnel committee or maybe they just take the recommendation of the human resources lady. But uh, it'll be interesting. There's been a lot of changes in city hall. Scott uh, has been just, uh, he's in that position, I guess, uh, at the right time, the right spot. He gets to make some appointments. He gets to control some of the changes that are being made in City Hall. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I, if I had any, if I had any, uh, what would you say, if I had any complaints about how they pick them, I don't understand how they, they, uh, they go out there, she was quoted in the Times as saying, as she was ordered to do, was to go around to these other communities and find out how much the city auditor makes in that town, and, uh, and then uh, bring those numbers back here to Woburn, and then we look at them, and of course we say we wanna be right in the middle of the pond. I don't understand that. I mean, we could say we're gonna have a city auditor for, uh, for $85,000 a year. Now, people apply, you interview them, and if you can get a good candidate for that kind of money, good. I don't know why it has to compete with the other cities and towns. The city of Woburn's pretty getting, we're getting close to 40,000 people now, or in the 37, eight, maybe in that area. So I don't know why we have to uh, deal with people that might be paying an auditor in Stoneham. Stoneham's a different place, Winchester's a different place, Medford or Tewksbury or wherever she goes to get this information. So it's just something that bugs me a little bit. She does it the same with the fire department and the police department. You know, being a policeman in Winchester's being different from being a policeman in Lawrence. You know what I mean? So it's just you, you apply for the job in that particular town. They're all union anyway, so I don't understand what the problem is. But it's, actually, it's not a problem, but it's just something that bothers me a little bit. But I wish uh, Surratt, I've known him for a long time, I wish him uh, well in his new endeavors and the new person, whoever might that might be. Now, the ride, I gotta stop saying now. Every time in between a little story, I say, now, like wake up because I'm not my, Annunciation isn't right, so I'll try and correct that. The ride is part of the MBTA process. We talked about this a little bit last week. They, you see the cars, they get vans and cars, and I think they can get cars, put two or three people in, or they get a van that might hold 10 people, but they, they drive people around to their appointments because the people who use the system uh, can't go out and get on a bus and do the regular thing. So they'll come to your house, pick you up, take you to your appointment, drop you off. Then maybe when you're through, somebody else, excuse me, might come and pick you up and bring you back. It might not be the same person. So anyway, they have, uh, the ride is located in the north of Boston, the south of Boston, and the west of Boston. Because the ride doesn't go east of Boston. They don't have a navy. So therefore, we're in the west. 
And what they like to do is locate a large number of motor vehicles in Woburn and leave Woburn every day and pick, do their work and then come back at night. And they're going to keep all these buildings, keep all these motor vehicles inside a building located on Wildwood Street. Now, you get old, when you go by Wildwood, you, you, you take a left from Salem Street onto, onto uh, Wildwood. When you go a couple of buildings where Kraft is, it says Kraft right on the building. Then the next building was a paper company. And there's a door-to-door -door storage company in there. And it's a pretty big building. So they'll have to do a lot of uh, renovations there because I, all these uh, uh, motor vehicles are going to be put inside. But I guess the hang up there is traffic because they get a lot of cars and they're going to leave in the morning, which uh, is a problem, and they come back in the evening, which is a problem because that's when the busiest uh, uh, situation is at the corner of Wildwood and Salem and Wood Street and there's no light there. And, uh, you know, we've been trying to get, we, when I say we, Mrs. Brune, I, so we'll have to put it on her. She's been trying to get a traffic light there since the day she was elected. So maybe this would be something that, that would push that along a little bit. I'm not really sure. These, there, there were uh, stories that uh, they were getting close, then they'd get far apart. I'm sure it's all about money because what we're trying to do is uh, make that uh, intersection of Wildwood and Wood Street straight across from each other and then Salem Street this way naturally. So uh, get, get that little hook out of there. So uh, maybe soon that'll happen. But uh, I think they might be having a little trouble with that amount of vehicles at that location uh, and the, the traffic might be a little bit more than the council can, uh, can handle at this time. So if they as it explained in the article, if, if, uh, if the ride requires the city council to vote and it's defeated, they can't come back for two years. But if they take a leave to withdraw and the council allows that, then they can just go home, redo their paperwork and uh, come back again maybe in a couple of months or maybe wait to see how the, the uh, traffic light situation is working out and maybe they decide they don't want to be in Woburn at all, so that's always a possibility. Now, I go to Moran Park every morning. There's, been high, there's handicapped parking spaces there, and one of them is gone. So there's one that's there. So now, if, if you're a customer down there, if you go there, it, 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 from 5 o'clock in the morning till around nine. People would go there, get a coffee, you can get all this other stuff, a donut or a muffin or whatever, uh, get your cigarettes, uh, lottery tickets and all that kind of stuff. The paper, every day you have to have the paper. And, uh, and they, you know, you double park, it doesn't make any difference, nobody's in that much of a hurry, but you run in, you get your stuff, you do your business, say hello, and out the door you go. So it's a busy little place there. And then when they put the, the two handicapped parking spaces, when they made the bump there for the, for the, uh, the uh, Marlow Park where the clock is, they put one on one side and one on the other side. Now I was under the impression, this is a few years back now we're talking, I was under the impression that when they did that, they put those two parking spaces there because they were gonna have the parking up in the Walnut Street parking lot, which is just up the stairs where the waterfall is. So you go up the stairs, you're gonna have two parking spaces there. And when the elevator came, we were gonna lose the two parking spaces on Main Street because we're providing two up top. Now I talked to Mrs. Uh, Andrews today, actually. And, she, and I asked her what her re recollection was. And uh, yeah, she, she, she's uh, right on top of that kind of stuff. So she says, the, there used to be one that was closer to the front of the bank. And that's the one, that's always been there. So therefore, that's one they moved up towards the clock. Now the one on the other side, that's gone anyway. So now I said, well, when you get the two up top, 
Does the other space go? No. Okay, so that's where we're at. So these things are being uh, looked at all the time. You know, in fact, I, 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 I don't want to quote her exactly because I don't want to get in trouble, but I'm going to anyway. I don't think she's against the, the, There's a lot of uh, handicapped parking spaces in the Walnut Street parking lot. And a lot of times uh, people claim that they're, they're, they're empty. Well, that's because all the rest of the parking spaces are taken up by people who park there at 7 in the morning, don't go home until 7 at night. So the place is packed all the time. But the handicapped uh, parking spaces are basically used by people, I'm sure, that run downtown and do their errands and come back. But they're a little bit too far away from the elevator, in her mind. Uh, I, that's an, I suppose we could argue over that. But anyway, if they could move those uh, 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 spaces that were maybe kind of promised that they would be there by uh, maybe the city engineer is going to look at it and the superintendent and put the two, two parking spaces right near where you could get to, onto the elevator easily at, with a wheelchair, say, then they could give up two in the middle of the parking lot and, and then the, the other uh, uh, people who own stores downtown would gain a couple of parking spaces. So that's, that's where we're at uh, with the handicap. Now, as an offshoot to that, I had some, uh, I was talking to a, uh, one of the members of the gang this morning also. I just, I did a lot of talking today, I can tell you that right now. And it was pretty interesting because what we're talking about is an incident that happened over at the uh, 99 restaurant where a young woman that lives over the west side went out with her friends. She's over 21. She went over the 99 to get something to eat with her friends. And, and she has Down syndrome. So they ordered a drink and she couldn't get a drink because she only had one uh, means of identification. You know, I don't know what they wanted, a passport, uh, they want all this other stuff anyway. But there's a state law in Massachusetts. There's a state law here in Massachusetts allowing individuals with such conditions who cannot obtain a driver's license to only have to produce one form of identification under such situations. Now, this was in the Times last week, this story. Now. She went home, she was a little upset, I'm sure, like I would have been, I would have been jumping all over the place. But anyway, she went home and told her mother and her mother went to the licensing board. And in the meantime, the, 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 the 99 restaurants have a, have a protocol, uh, however you want to describe it, whereby they want you to have two forms of identification. Now, the state law says in her situation, she only has to have one. So. Now, there's a big, as usual, it gets in a big muddle. But the 99 through there, I'm sure it started with the waitress or the waiter or the bartender. Then it goes to the manager, the assistant manager, and finally goes up the road to finally where corporate 99. And what happened over a period of a few days or weeks that the corporate 99 kind of agreed with her that they kind of made a mistake. So what they did was change their uh, protocols in all the 99 restaurants, which is a pretty good thing. If you think you can move uh, a corporate uh, uh, a restaurant chain that has 100 restaurants, or at least 99 of them anyway, I don't, I, that's, a, that's a big deal. So anyway, the 99, as it, as it says in the article, uh, uh, stepped up to the plate said, well, we'll go along with the state law that says you only have to have a, a, a driver's license, the same as your regular driver's license, with your picture on it and everything, except, except you can't drive a car with it. So the only reason this came up in the conversation was that this person is trying to, uh, I guess, ask me if I would implement the conversation to, to other places that are corporate in the city of Woburn or surrounding communities or anybody who's watching this program that goes out to other communities, that the law is, is what it is so that they should make the same adjustments that the 99 did. 
so that if you go someplace in Massachusetts in a 99, you don't have to go through all this because they already made the change. But say you go to another restaurant chain and we want them to, to come along with the 99 and get that all straightened out. So we don't want to have anybody that has any uh, uh, problems like that to be embarrassed or feel uncomfortable, uh, not being able to have a good time with you when you're out with your friends. So that's what we want to do. We want everybody on the same page as far as being able to get a nice glass of beer or a good cold drink in a 99 restaurant. The Woman Community Educational Foundation. Now there's something there, that's a mouthful of uh, a lot of, uh, how many letters in the alphabet? Every one of them is, isn't used in this, this deal here. But anyway, everybody belongs to it. Uh, Joe Crowley is, is a head of it, and uh, there's a few people, other people I'm sure. These people are well known in the community. Now, what they're gonna do is, they're going to have an executive director, and there's a grant writer, an experienced grant writer, and they, they're going to uh, raise money through grants, donations, uh, maybe ask uh, people to donate. And what's going to happen is they're going to uh, help the school department in areas where they think the school department doesn't have any money, or they're going to use their money to help the school department develop. So I, this, I, I'm, 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 I'm against this. So far, I'm against it. Anyway, why are you against it, Ed? Okay, I'm against it because I, I believe that anything that happens in the schools, in far as education is concerned, should be in the taxes. You should pay for it. Because I honestly believe in my old age that yeah, I think some of these things have been started in the past. People try and raise money to help other organizations. And when times are good, there's plenty of dough. But when times are bad, there's no money. So you spend five or six years building a program where you're giving X amount of dollars into the school department for the development of uh, a volleyball team. And you can buy equipment, uh, get the girls uniforms, get all the stuff that might go in there. So the city said, we don't have any money to do that. So now this outfit comes along, the Woman Community Education Foundation says, well, we will donate some of the money to that specific cause. So now that goes along and everything's crew going great for a couple of years. Then all of a sudden the economy stinks and there's no money. So what happens then? The girls volleyball team folds? Uh, did the city have to absorb that? Uh, has, you know, there's a few questions in there that I want to uh, ask. I'll have to call Joe Crowley or maybe Joe Crowley's daughter who's on the school committee now, which I'd love to have her in here, just to meet her uh, and talk maybe a little bit about this. The people who are running it are all experienced people, all the way from the superintendent schools, to uh, members of the Urban Redevelopment Authority, some real estate people in the city. They know what they're doing, they're not silly. So they've talked this over and they decide to do it. It's just that I remember, I've gone through this a few times. I have friends who are small business people. They get calls every single day for a hundred bucks. Can you donate a hundred? Donate a hundred to this, donate a hundred to that. Now, if they did that, they'd be donating more money than they're making. So there's a lot of people out there asking for a lot of money. Now, this is another group that's going to put the arm on people in the city or people who have foundations out there that give, people, give money away, and the grant writer is going to uh, write a, uh, maybe a grant and see if she can get some money. But I mean, even, even uh, foundations are not loaded with all kinds of money. But when times are good, there's time to roll. When times are bad, things fall down. So I, I, I just like to know a little bit more about how they can steady this thing off for a long period of time, if that makes any sense. But I think that uh, when you get involved in the schools, now they claim that other cities and towns do this and they've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
I'm very concerned about, uh, 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 there was one quote, I think it was in the Times that said, like they, they were able to buy iPads for students. You know, although not, they're not cheap. So that's a good thing. If you could buy a student an iPad, and I don't know how they control that, whether the kid gets to keep it, or has to turn it in at the end of the year once they get used to using it, all, all that kind of stuff. So I don't know, there's, there's a few questions I could ask, but we'll look into that as it goes along. The, the chairman of the school committee is on there, as, uh, Mr. Meadows. He's, uh, he's, he was just in here a few weeks ago. Uh, so we, we, can, we can find out these things. It's just I have that, uh, I've been through enough recessions, so to speak, to know that it doesn't stay, the economy never stays good. It's like 10 years good, three years bad. 10 years good, four years bad. It goes up and down, the stock market, all that kind of stuff. So when you want to raise money, it's very difficult. In this particular time, we're, we're, we're getting better now. The economy's getting better. I'd have to ask Paul, he's on some secret assignment somewhere. He, he'd say, well, you know, you know, he's very conservative like that. I'd say that I think the economy is getting a little better. You know, we have a good month, a bad month, but it, it, I think the phone, I asked these guys that are contractors if the phone's ringing. Well, it's not ringing like it was when Clinton was president, but it's ringing and it's beginning to get a little work. I think you could see things are, are, are picking up a little bit. So that's, that's going to be an important thing. So we're going to follow that line and see how that works out. Uh, the mayor and officers of Napoli reached an agreement. I don't want to go into that because none of my business. I think as far as transparency is concerned, you can find out if you want to know that how, what he did or how much he's making and when he's 62 or 5 or how much he's going to get, you can go look it up yourself. Because I think if, if the mayor and him agreed, then that's something between them. I understand the transparency part, but I don't, personally, I don't care. So if you want to find out about it, go right ahead. Coop. The architect for the uh, Harold Wyman School, the mayor, Mike Mulrennan, and a few other bureaucrats from the uh, school went to Boston. They, I guess they got to view some presentations by some architects relative to schools. And uh, this is all getting our ducks in a row because we're not going to build a school next week, but it's getting closer and closer. They picked a company called Donisco Design Partnership out of Boston. And they have some experience building schools. They built a couple of elementary schools in Peabody, an elementary school and a high school in North Andover. So they know what they're doing as far as building schools. And being, uh, it's an altogether different uh, uh, mindset, I think, to somebody going out there and building an industrial building or a commercial building, even if it's for a big electronics concern, when it comes to comparing that to building this building that I'm sitting in. Because these buildings are special. And there's still a lot of things in here that I would have changed, but it's too late now. But in the future, we have more and more experience on building schools because we just built a bunch of them. And now we're going to go ahead with the, uh, with the Herald and the uh, Wyman in the next couple of years. So we'll find out exactly uh, how that goes. We're, like I say, we're getting our ducks in a row. So that's uh, progress being made. And there's not a lot of cities and towns that are in the same financial situation that the city of Woburn is, which is good. Because then the competition for the state money is not as high. So then these people come in and look at the city of Woburn. If you uh, say your, your debt situation is handled, is it being able to be handled, uh, you can afford to uh, take on a little bit more to build a new school, which we need. Uh, that we're going to close two and build one. So that'll be good. Uh, the, the savings as far as teachers and custodians and blah, 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 that never works. You, there's never, you can have all these teachers and say, what happened to them? You know, and the Wyman closes, all the teachers hit the bricks. I don't think so. They go over to the new school. So it's just a question of how the bureaucracy works. You, you, you have to start at the bottom. There's never an end to it, never an end to it. Once the school is built and uh, dedicated and 
got a name on it, and the kids are in there getting educated. We're already working on the next one. So by the time we get through with the other, either the North Woburn, maybe a school, and build a couple of fire stations or whatever, we'll be right back in the school business, you know, because they don't last like they used to. Or we don't make them last like we used to. So that'll be an interesting thing. Get your ducks in a row, and that's what we're doing. Now, Ms. Gatta. How about we watch rain and see what he's got on the sports scene, and then we can watch the weather right after that. Hello, folks, and welcome once again to sports. As always, I'm your host, Rain Newcomb, and today we will be looking at various topics from around the world of sports. The Woburn Boys varsity basketball team season ended on Friday night as the boys were not able to triumph over Ling Classical. The boys hung in for most of the game, however, poor refereeing and a seemingly contagious inability to hit a shot did them in. It was a great season and I expect an even better one next year. The girls and boys varsity hockey teams were also dealt defeats this weekend. The girls loss can be attributed to the lack of one of their star players who was absent from the ice. On Saturday, Devils forward and NHL legend Yarmir Yager passed an impressive milestone in his storied hockey career. In the second period of the game against the Islanders, Yager scored his 700th career goal, an impressive feat in itself. This accolade makes him only the second player ever to score 700 career goals, next to Wayne Gretzky. Capital star Alexander Ovechkin also had a banner weekend, scoring his 800th career point in the Capitals game against the Bruins. At this rate, Ovechkin could be challenging Yager for the 700 goal title in the near future. On a positive note, the girls basketball team came out on top of a particularly exciting overtime game on Sunday to advance in the tournament. Well, that's all for today, folks. For sports, I'm Ray Newcomb. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of the show. Good man. Good job, Rain. Get off there. Get out of my hair. Okay, he's a good kid. That's a good job. I think our sports teams are doing pretty well. I think the boys basketball team lost, but the girls did very well. So we're cruising along all right. Now, Jennifer, let's take a look at the weather. Here we are, the weather forecast, 24, good grief, 29. But there's that 40 degree day on Thursday. Or was that Friday? I can't see. That's Friday. Okay, 40 degrees on Friday, that's all right. We've got to be getting into more 40 degree days because we're getting into March now. I mean, it's not going to snow in June, I hope so. We've got to do this. I want you to, I want you to look at this, and, and just, <laughs> it's just an observation. I was watching last night the news on, I forget what station, it doesn't make any difference, they're all the same. It was about the, the big problem they have in the Ukraine with the Russians. Uh, a couple of people ran off the highway because a woman was 21 years old with a baby in the back was drunk and she drove into a pond. They had to go rescue the car. And then the last thing was, I forget, it was some, uh, some, some other thing. It was Oh, a house was burnt in Roxbury or someplace. So there's, those are the three news items in the, in the, uh, on the news. Nothing going on in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts worth reporting. And uh, so they put, then they run with the weather. Now, whether it's a male or female, it makes no difference. They're on, at the beginning of the news, they're on when the news is like 10 minutes on. Then they're on the news when it's almost over. And the, the last thing they're going to tell you is, it's going to be cold tonight. Oh, good. That's good. So that's what the weather is. Now, our weather is a little box. And it only takes two minutes to look at it. It's got all these nice little things on there that tell you when it's going to snow or rain or what the temperature is going to be. And it's not that far off uh, as far as accuracy is concerned. So I don't know how the weather got to be such a, a big, important part of the local news situation. And we have, all these here, we have four, five, six is ne ne uh, New England Cable, uh, seven, is uh, NBC. Now you, you throw Fox in there. And if you want to watch what's going on in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or what might be going on in the city of Woburn or Burlington or any other town, and you switch the news on, all you're going to do is get the weather. And the weather 
is either good or bad. In England, I had spent some time in England. You know what they say? It's a nice day, or it's raining, or it's snowing, or it's cold, or what. It's, it's none of this. Who cares which way the wind is blowing? I don't know. Who cares what the dew point is? Who cares that it's 20 degrees outside, but if you're careful, if you don't wear a scarf, it's really only 10. Because it feels like 10 stuff. So they have to go through all this stuff. It just makes me crazy. And we have a better weather program. So I think pay attention to it. All right. 299 Michigan Road. If you know where that is off the top of your head, you get a point. A Tommy point from Tommy Heinzel. So now, 299 is across the street from the Woolen Mall. There's a boat place there, which used to be up on Washington Street. Bliss, is it Bliss Marine? Yeah, I think it is Bliss Marine. And then there's Sleepy's there. So what they want to do, somebody's proposing this, is they want to make Sleepy smaller. They're going to not add anything. They're the same building. They're going to make Sleepy smaller, and they're going to put a restaurant in there and a bank. Be good restaurant. I never heard of it, but there's one in uh, up the mall, I guess. And they sell regular quick food, people shopping, running, get a sandwich, a salad or whatever, and maybe stuff to go. And, uh, and that's their uh, gig. And then the Century Bank, which we already have one in movement anyway that I know of. Uh, so they're going to be in there too. So the biggest problem there is it's the same as anything on that side of the street, starting at the 99 and coming down to Scrub-A-Dub where the gas station is. And then uh, now there's a Dunkin' Donuts there right across from the, at the light. And there's a, there's a restaurant in the back, the hotel. And then we get to Sleepy's and all this other stuff. It, getting out of those places is very difficult. If you go in the flow of traffic, it's not too bad. But you cannot make a left-hand turn there. You cannot be there and try and go left, like going back towards uh, uh, the Chinese restaurant or going back towards the 99. It's almost impossible. So we'll see how that works out. 299 Michuam Road. But like I just got through saying, there's a sign, there's a, it's a sign of the times. Three, four years ago, you didn't see, nobody was building anything and nobody was moving anywhere. And over the past couple of years, you notice on even on that side of the street where things are very difficult, there's a Dunkin' Donuts one in there next to the sandwich place. Uh, and now you get another restaurant, I don't know if you'd describe it as a fast food restaurant, I'm not sure. Another restaurant going in there and a bank, which people are going to go in and get their money and deposit their money. So uh, it'll be interesting, the conversation will be interesting there. Because somebody's always going to try, you can put a sign up as big as this building and say, do not take a left hand turn, somebody's going to do it anyway. And I could be guilty of it myself, but I try not to do it. But the one, the one that makes you crazy is, is the Dunkin' Donuts on uh, Washington Street, right after you go through the light at uh, on Montville Avenue. The, your people make a left here to, to go in the Dunkin' Donuts. You're not supposed to make a left there and, and, and go in there. You've got traffic held up, people trying to get to work. The highway's already uh, congested anyway, so I suppose they don't care. But anyway, that's the difference. When times are good, people spend money. When they're not good, they don't spend money. All right. The sixth annual Donald Manzelli Memorial Telethon is a big deal here at the station because we started that uh, like six years ago. And it's being it's 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 a, it's a very difficult thing to put together, but uh, the people who do it, Lauren Coleman runs it, and the other employees here, everybody gets involved. The shoe comes down and puts his two cents worth in. Uh, all the politicians will show up and uh, make contributions. Uh, it's a great cause. It's a great cause. Manzelli was a great guy. He was very dedicated to the Council for Socially Concerned. And I think that the Council for Social Concern over the past 10 years that I have anything to do with it, or even know it was even there, I know that uh, they worked their tails off 
and they take care of a lot of people. And the kids in this school did a great job raising uh, uh, a food bank downstairs and all that food went up to the uh, council. But people are in there every day and they're in there every week, every month because that's where they get their food. They don't, get the, they don't have the money to go to Demoulos and go shopping. Or maybe they do have some money and they go to Demoulos and do some shopping. And when that is, is, uh, money is, is expired, then they come up and get a bag of groceries out of the, out of the uh, Council for Social Concern. So the telephone is on this Sunday coming from 12 to 3. So put it on your TV and watch it. And it benefits the Council of Social Concerns, as I've already said four times. Now, you can either call or stop by. We have a phone bank. You can call up and make a contribution, or you can come by with a check, and we'll mark you, we'll mark you right through a door over here, out onto this rug here, and have a nice picture in the back, and you can talk and uh, say who you are and deposit a check. So if you'd like to do that, do it. Or if you want to turn around and give uh, the check to somebody else, they'll take it. Or if you want to mail a check right to the Council for Social Concern, then uh, that'll work too. All they want to do is, this is just an effort to raise money. And everybody has contributed uh, very well over the, past, uh, over the past six years. So we'll thank you for that. And uh, I want to give you this phone number, so if you've got a pen, write this down. 781-995-4178. So that's, a, uh, that's the number you can call and say how much you'd like to give. And then if you don't give it, they send me and Meany out to collect it. We're like the collector, we'll be the collectors. Yeah, we'll scare you with us. We'll just bang on your door and say, give us the money, you promised me the money, give it to me. Uh, it's fun, it's has fun, it's fun to see a lot of people. All these things that, that the, uh, that the uh, city movement gets involved in, they're all like going to your class reunion, you know? I mean, from, from the older people, uh, at the, uh, senior citizens up there in North Hoover, to the younger kids in the schools uh, uh, trying to raise money, uh, Girl Scout cooks, all that kind of stuff. It's like you get involved, you stay involved, and you just stay involved your whole life. So get, we gotta make more money than we did last year, that's for sure. All right, on the, on the light side, we want to have the Oscar winners. I don't know how that thing got to be Oscar, but I, I we'll have to look that up, I guess, Oscar winners. And if you know this already, just hang with me. The best picture was 12 Years a Slave. I don't know anything about it. I know it has something to do with slavery, so it can't be very good, but it's, I guess it was a great movie because it's got best picture. The best actor, Matthew McGonaghy. Best Actress, Kate Blanchett. Best Supporting Actor, Jared Leto. And Best Supporting Actress, Lapita Nagongo. And she was the supporting actress in that movie, 12 Years a Slave. So they did very well. All right. So the last thing on my list is I'd like to say, in all seriousness, uh, I want to send my regards out to my friend, uh, the representative from the 30th Middlesex district who lost his dad in the past couple of weeks. So we didn't get a chance. I sent him a, a, a message that I was thinking of him, but I want him to know that all the people here at the, sta at the, at the station that he's friends with and all the people out there that he has friends with are all feeling for him. So uh, that's about as far as I can go with it, Jimmy, and we're thinking of you. Next time.